Welcome to Sunrise Life, the podcast where we have deep conversations with freelance models. And today I have a guest, Ayona Gabrielle, on the line. Say hello. Hey, guys. <laughs> How are you? Where are you right now? Where am I? That's actually a good question. I can't even keep up. I'm in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Okay. Yeah, I've been through there. I don't think I've actually had any bookings there before. I actually do really well here. It's surprising because I know a lot of models, like they don't stop through or if they do, they don't get a lot. But maybe it's just because I've come to Oklahoma City so many times that I do well here now. But I usually end up here at least a handful of times every year. That's awesome. Yeah, usually when I go through, I'm just trying to get from one place to the next and I haven't made a stop. Yeah, there's some really great photographers here. I love working with. I shot with a photographer the other day. We went to the Wichita Mountains, which are about an hour and a half from OKC. Uh huh. And that was amazing. And I posted a couple of photos from just like quick phone photos that I took of the locations. And everybody's like, oh my gosh, are you in like Colorado or something? And I'm like, this is Oklahoma. Oh, really? That sounds cool. I didn't really know that there was a lot of interesting nature out there. There's actually so much interesting nature in Oklahoma. And then even like the panhandle of Central Texas has a lot. It's just off of the beaten path. So most people don't know about it. That's cool. I'm into that kind of stuff. <laughs> so when I I reached out to you for the podcast... I've kind of interacted with you a little bit on social media here and there. And like the interactions that I get with you, I get a sense that you just really love what you do. I really do. It's a lot of fun. And I've noticed that, I don't know how long you've been touring actively, but I've noticed more recently, just from my perspective, that it seems like you're working really hard and you're going to a lot of cities every month. And I think it's really impressive. I've been so insane i think that when like other things in my life are not going well i just kind of like immerse myself into work more and more and every time i do like some crazy long trip i tell myself never again and then six months later i'm planning something like even crazier (laughs) how long so maybe i'm like addicted to it or something i don't know i have felt exactly that because i i haven't gone on extremely long tours but I made all my tours between 7 to 14 days, and I just packed them with as many shoots as I could. Yeah, and- I, I started at the beginning of last year doing it where I would do one longer tour, and then the next tour do like something smaller, and then do another bigger tour. It has worked really well, but right now my life has just been like in flames, so I've just been touring. What is a long tour, like, lengthwise for you, and then what's a short one? I'd say a short one would be anywhere between, like, a few days and, like, a week and a half max. Part of that, too, is I live in Texas, so it takes forever to get anywhere. Long would be anywhere from, like, two weeks to typically six weeks. Wow, that's so hardcore. Oh, which right now, because my life has been crazy, I haven't been home in almost two months. Do you, like, designate days off so that you can kind of rest in between? Sometimes when I'm smart about it. (laughs) And then there's other times where I'm like, wow, I really screwed myself here. Like, I remember when you first messaged me, it was in 2021. It was my first, like, big out west tour. And you messaged me and you're like, are you driving all of this? Yeah. And I was because I'm a lunatic and I was by (laughs) myself. That that trip was so good, but I also got hurt on that trip. So it was a mixed bag. You got hurt? Like what happened? I fell down a flight of stairs in Las Vegas and I tore my knee. The best Uh. part too is that I was sober. (laughs) And so I'm like, I can't even be like, oh, uh, I was like drunk in Vegas. No, I was just leaving a shoot. Oh, my gosh. And then I still had two weeks of tour. Oh, my God. And you had to do it with a torn knee? Did you have to go to the hospital? I probably should have gone. I didn't. 
Wow. It was definitely torn though. It took like four or five months to heal. And I just oh. took a lot of ibuprofen in the meantime. You have a bird? <laughs> I have a dog. Oh, is that your dog? <laughs> yeah, he's scratching himself. Being oh, he's like, okay. You're not paying attention to me. That's cute. He's sleeping right before this. And now oh. he's like, you're not paying attention? He's like his own sort of famous too. Everybody loves him. That's awesome. I think I remember you posting about your dog. Yeah. He goes pretty much everywhere with me too, which has been pretty insane. That's awesome. You So he rides in your car and like goes to all yes. your shoots? He gets the whole back seat to himself. He goes to some of my shoots, just depending on like what's going on, where I am, who it is. But yeah. most of the time I just leave him in the hotel room so that I don't want to strangle him. Because <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> Spending uh, every single hour with him is just a little too much. Yeah, I can understand that. It's good that he doesn't get separation anxiety too much, I'm guessing. He did when he was a puppy, but I think now like he just has realized, like, I'm going to come back. That's good. Um, for, for our listeners, would you mind describing how you first got into modeling and then how you got into yeah, full-time absolutely. freelancing? So I was following this photographer in my hometown on Instagram. He had worked with, I think, a few people that I like knew from just life, essentially. I really loved his work. I thought it was really beautiful. I had gone through and, you know, done the whole like, like every photo mm-hmm. thing. And it was, I genuinely did like them. I had three, well, I had, Two tattoos at the time, I was about to get my third tattoo. And Scott, he was doing a tattoo series. And he saw that, he saw my tattoos on my Instagram. And he messaged me. He's like, obviously, you like my work. I'm doing this tattoo series. If you'd like to be part of it, you're more than welcome to come over. We can shoot. He's like, you've obviously also seen that I shoot nudes. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But if you're interested in trying it, we can do that. And I was just like, oh, I don't know. Like, let's just see how I feel when I get there. So I brought some outfits over. And I don't think we did full nude. We might have. I know we did topless for sure. But we started with just, like, the tattoos. And we took photos of that. And all of the photos of me with my clothes on, I look uncomfortable. The minute that my top came off, I was just like, oh, I got this. This is fine. Nice. And so then he was just like, do you want to come shoot again some like next week or some other time? And I was like, sure, why not? And so we ended up shooting together so many times. I don't think I'll ever shoot with anybody as much as him. We stopped counting at 150 shoots. Wow, holy cow, that's awesome. We lived 10 minutes apart. And so for like a two-year period, every Sunday morning, we would get together and shoot if we could. That's cool. And like, he knows my family. He's a really great guy. Like, I have a lot to thank because of him. And then when I started getting reached out to a lot from people all, all over the country, asking me if I was going to travel. At the time, I was just like, absolutely not. No, that's not going to be my life. That's not going to be what I'm doing. And then a lot of things in my life blew up. And Scott and a couple other photographers that I had become really close friends with at that point convinced me to do like a small weekend trip to Atlanta. And so I did that and it kind of gave me like the travel bug, but I couldn't figure out quite yet like how to make it work logistically full time. So I spent about six months like doing small stuff, small little trips and trying to figure out how to make it work full time. And then I had a guy fly me to Idaho, which that was a bad experience. Oh. And we can get into that later. Okay. (laughs) But even though it was a bad experience, it gave me the confidence to know that, like, okay, this is working well enough that I can transition to doing it full time. And so right after my birthday, I started traveling full time and basically haven't looked back since then. That's and that awesome. was four years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a solid amount of time. That's awesome. It's been crazy. So you were doing it in the pandemic and all of that too. 
Yeah, I moved from the Panhandle of Florida where I grew up to Texas in the middle of 2020 because it was the only way that I could make income, essentially. Yeah, there's not very many photographers in Florida. You said you're on the Panhandle in, in Florida? Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. nobody there that hires there's, in, that I know of. There's a few. Because, like, when I go visit my family, I always pick up a little bit of work. Oh. Huh. But there's not enough to justify it if you don't have other reasons to be there. Yeah, understandable. And it's not enough, like, to justify living there. Yeah, totally understandable. And I, and I had already exhausted, at that point, my contacts in, like, New Orleans. I won't work in Alabama because it's never a good time. I've tried. Maybe, maybe there's, like, good photographers there, and I just haven't met them. But I always have bad experiences there. I had exhausted Atlanta and that was like at the height of Atlanta getting to be kind of really bad with like being predatory. Yeah. And then everything else was like eight plus hours. So moving to Texas was the smartest thing that I could think to do at the time while still remaining somewhat comfortable. That's good. Yeah, there's Texas has the Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin that seem to be all pretty decent. And there's photographers in the the little itty bitty towns. I'll do like pass throughs. Yeah. So if I'm already driving through an area, I'll stop and shoot with somebody in the middle of nowhere. I've actually passed through Lubbock, and apparently there are photographers there too. (laughs) Yeah, there's a couple in Lubbock, there's a couple in Abilene. There's a couple in Amarillo. I think there's some in Midland and Odessa, but almost nobody goes through there. Yeah. All this talk is making me want to do a Texas trip. (laughs) Oh, you should. There's so many amazing locations in Texas. I should. My, My year is dedicated. This Right now, I'm kind of focusing all my energy on just maintaining my income, but seeing my mom more because she's in poor health. Yeah, that makes sense. If I were to do something like that, it would probably be, like, more of a last-minute thing, but... Well, if you do decide to and you need some, like, cool locations to check out, let me know. I have yeah. a bajillion things pinned. I haven't been to them all, but I have a bajillion things pinned. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be interested. I love exploring. When I was van lifing, it was a lot easier for me to, like, go somewhere on the side of the road when I'm taking my my life from one spot to the next but now I've got a big rig and I have to kind of plan my stops yeah my biggest problem is the big dumb dog oh (laughs) well he's your emotional support too so yeah he's great it just like sometimes makes planning kind of difficult I had to like completely adjust how I was scheduling like getting into towns and getting out of towns But it's been really good for me because it's forced me to take care of myself better Mm. and to enjoy the trips more and actually like sightsee and things like that. What would you say your favorite genre of modeling is? Probably anything outside. I feel like the world has so many unique locations to offer and so much that you can do with that. And While studio shoots can be fun, they can be really repetitive. And it's really hard to be repetitive in different environments. Yeah, I feel the same way. Unless they have some really interesting concept or like unique lighting thing happening, I'm usually bored in a studio. (laughs) Yeah, it, it kind of like going through the motions feeling. And then I feel bad that I feel like that. But it's like, I've done this a thousand times. Yeah, it is hard to come up with like, reinvent the wheel all over again exactly so you mentioned a few moments in your past when your career was building that you had some like weird experiences I have oh this- there's been so many <laughs> i have this section of my podcast that i like to call the photo shoot fail of the week can you describe a photo shoot or two if you have more than one story? We're, um, we're welcome so to hear them. There, um, there's so, so many. I'll, I'll talk about the Idaho one Okay. since I already mentioned it. So it was like really one of my first trips that I took. And I had never flown alone, first of all. So I was having like major anxiety 
flying from Florida to Idaho. And I had done everything I should have done leading up to it. Like I talked to him, we set everything up. I checked lots of references because I'm like, I don't know this guy. I don't know anybody who does know this guy. Like, I need to be as thorough as I possibly can. All the references that I checked with who got back with me were like, oh, he's awesome to work with. Like, you won't have any problems. And you know what? For them, he might have been. But for me, it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. So he picks me up from the airport when I get there. And he had hired me for the next two days. And then the morning after the second day, I was going to be flying back home. And he hosted me as well. And so he picks me up from the airport and we're in the car and he's talking about trying to shoot that night. And I'm like, no, I just was on an airplane for a collective of like seven hours. This is the first time I've ever flown. And I flew by myself. Like, I do not have it in me. Also, you're not paying me for tonight. This is not what we discussed. So it was already like a red flag. Mm hmm. So then we get to his house and we go to bed after a while because I don't remember what happened that night. We went to bed and the bedroom that I was staying in didn't have a lock on the door. And so I woke up the next morning because he was sitting on the edge of the bed with his hand on my thigh, like very high up on my thigh. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, oh, well, I was seeing when you're going to get up. And I'm like. When my alarm goes off, we talked about this last night. We talked about when we're starting. I was like, I set my alarm accordingly so that I can get up, get ready. Like, he's like, oh, well, I didn't think you were getting up quick enough. And I'm like, well, you shouldn't have come in here. Like, what the hell? Yeah, that's creepy. It was so creepy. So then we shoot that day. And that night he looks at me and he goes, oh, yeah. So by the way, I invited another model for tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, thanks for telling me last minute. And so the next morning she shows up and we're supposed to go to this abandoned cement factory in Oregon. It's like an hour and a half away. And they were talking about it, how great it is and all this. And I was like, well, when was the last time you scouted it? He's like, oh, not that long ago. I was like, okay, cool. This model, I hesitate to even call her a model because she was very low on the local model end. Okay. If that makes sense. She screamed at her boyfriend on the phone for the 45 minutes that she had signal on the way to the location and the 45 minutes back that she had signal because they were fighting. She tried to sell me drugs and I was just like, first of all, I'm not interested. Second of all, I'm flying tomorrow. Like that does me no good. No, thank you. And then she tried to tell me like why I should buy them. The best part of it all was the cement factory wasn't there. <gasps> like we get there, we pull up, and there's nothing there. Like, there's not even rubble left of it. Like, they have completely torn it down and removed all of the mess. Shit. Oh, and I forgot. He also, the day before that, when we were shooting, he started telling me about how he had shot this couple intimately. And how cool he thought that was. And I was like, okay, well, I'm glad you think that's cool, but I don't want to hear about that. Like, that has nothing to do with our shoot or anything that I would do ever. And then he starts telling me about how he's been divorced for this many years. And I'm like, I'm sorry to hear that. And then about 10 minutes later, he goes, I really miss physical touch. Could I give you a massage? Oh, my God. <laughs> It just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And so then afterwards, when I made it home and he sent me all the images, every single photo, even the stuff we took inside, was blown out. <laughs> and he's like, why won't you post any of these? I'm like, you're creepy. They're horrible. I could take a better photo with a flip phone. <laughs> so that was probably like one of the worst experiences. I've had other like really crappy things happen, but that one... Nobody's really topped that because it was just so many levels that, of that sucks. When you're so you said you had a lot of positive references, but for some reason he decided that you were the one that he was gonna like go all out on. I yeah, guess. I think it was because I was traveling there and he hadn't worked with anybody except for like local models. 
Oh, so he just, I guess, felt entitled to... Yeah, you know, kind of felt like I was going to be his escort or something, when absolutely not. There's no qualms about ladies who do that, but that's not me. Yeah, you weren't advertising that kind of service, and that wasn't your agreement, so... That's, uh, you know, I've actually steered away from people who say they want to fly me in for a shoot because I've heard other similar stories where they get... Yeah, I haven't let anybody else do it (laughs) since then. Yeah, if you can just book your own flights and you don't have to worry about, like, if you fall out of favor with them, if they're going to cancel your return flight or something. Exactly. (laughs) That was before I was, like, driving around full-time. Like, that was the trip that, like, started me being full-time. I don't know how I went, still went into it after that, because I was just like, what the hell just happened? Yeah, well, you knew that you liked expressing yourself in front of the camera, but that one and I experience- think I knew that, like, it wasn't everyone, but he was just a horrible human. Yeah, I had a really bad first shoot experience, but I knew that I still wanted to model, but it what it did kind of make me more cautious, I guess, afterwards. I've just learned at this point that, like, if they shoot mostly local models, for me, it's almost a red flag. Yeah, yeah, not always, but definitely. Not always, but it's like, I'm a lot more hesitant. Yeah, because they might not have, like, the protocol for how to work with an experienced model. Like, what is... Exactly. That sucks. I'm sorry that that happened. It sounds very inappropriate, and I know that... It was horrible. He also, I don't know, I don't want to sound like I'm making fun of him, but I'll, like, never forget, like, certain, like, ways and mannerisms about him just because, like, it just added to how awkward and weird the whole experience was. So, like, I look back and I'm like, man, the whole thing was really, really weird. Yeah. It sucks when you trust somebody and then you get there and then it's just not what you expected at all. <laughs> yeah, and I was, like, 20, 21. And so it's not like I could have, like, rented a car and left either. So I was, like, just kind of stuck dealing with it. That sucks. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you now? I turned 25 last month. Oh, congrats. Thank you. (laughs) That's awesome. I worked on my birthday. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) Uh, Per usual. The years that I haven't worked on my birthday, I was, like, sad that there was no photos on my birthday. (laughs) <laughs> okay yeah do you ever consider yourself a workaholic absolutely my mother tells me i'm an extremist in all things i do yeah i just can't stop like i think this year which part of it's circumstantial this year i've only been home a total of like four weeks wow well, that's that sounds pretty rough but i mean if you're happy on the road i'm making it work <laughs> It's not bad. It's just life. Yeah. Is there anything at home that when you go home, you have something to look forward to? Yes and no. <laughs> oh, my life has just like been on fire. So I've been going through this like really, really horrible breakup. Oh, shit. And like I'm pretty private about my personal life with most people just because people get weird. So when I left at the beginning of this trip, my now ex and I were still together. It was very rocky and like we needed to break up anyways, but we hadn't. And so I left on the trip and then he broke up with me Mm. and I was just like, okay, that's not that unexpected. And at first it was like really amicable. Like he was being nice about it. And then, and it was already like a planned six week trip so i was just like well it's gonna be a while before like i can come back and like handle things in the meantime he has managed to get another girlfriend he says he's gotten her pregnant i don't know if it's true or not i don't really care and he has moved her in wow and told me do not come home unless it is to get your things and move out Oh, uh-huh. so you were living together before yeah. you went on tour when you broke up. Wow, that's messed up. <laughs> right? And when I was like, do you understand how, like, horrible the situation is? I was like, you can't just, like, wait to move her in. He told me that it wasn't his fault. 
and that I just needed to get over it. Okay. And that he was quote unquote not being a dick. <laughs> okay. And I was just like, okay, um, I'm pretty sure that I'm not delusional and that you are being a dick, but okay, cool. What the fuck? Sounds like a piece of work. Yeah, it's um the spin was so much fun. I really enjoy it. <laughs> So being on the road gives you something that's enjoyable and keeps your mind off of stress that's back home. Yes, and it's given me time to try to figure out my life. That's good. Well, that's awesome. Do you um, predict that you'll be doing this style of touring and bookings for your main source of income indefinitely for now? Uh, There's other things I would like to do, but it seems like they always just get pushed aside. Yeah. Or that I just can't figure out how to, like, make them bigger priorities or, like, profitable. Yeah, I feel that. I've always had side projects happening, too, and I enjoy doing them. But it does seem that, like, the modeling and, like, the subscription sites that I have are always my main sources of income, which I'm cool with. You know, if my side projects don't take off, I'm cool with that too. (laughs) I think part of it too for me is that I started modeling a month before I turned 19. And then I started touring part-time when I was 20 and then full-time when I turned 21. And so realistically, I haven't really done anything else for work. I haven't really had anything else going on in my adult life. And so it's like, what would I even do? And how would I go about it? Well, you like being creative and you seem very driven. So I'm sure that if you decided you wanted to delve into something else that, you know, just happen naturally. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of like nature and landscape photography just for my own enjoyment. So I don't lose my mind. That's cool. I would like to learn how to do stained glass art. I have all the stuff. I just haven't had time. I used to do ceramics. I used to paint. I used to draw. So I'm sure that whenever like this chapter starts to close by then I'll have something figured out, but I don't foresee it closing anytime in the near future to where I need to rush to figure it out. That's good. I think that's healthy anyway. I mean, the the income from traveling modeling for you is probably going to be really good for a really long time. As long as, you know, I'm sure that you're already doing this, but for anybody that's out there listening, like how to make it work, just show up on time and like, yeah, that's all you gotta do. I always show up at least like 10 to 15 minutes early. I prefer to show up like 30 minutes early if it's my (laughs) first shoot of the day, because then I can sit in my car, decompress, do my makeup real quick, take care of any emails that I need to take care of and make sure I'm caffeinated. Nice. That's a good system. <laughs> it's what has seemed to work the best. Like if I try to do my makeup before, it never ends up working out. Like the whole day just goes to shit. Does it kind of melt off? <laughs> not even that. If I'm not caffeinated, which I'm usually not when I'm like leaving the hotel or a host house, I'm usually not caffeinated yet. And so I end up just getting irritated trying to do my makeup and then it just throws off my whole mood. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that you're saying I really resonate with because I'm also a caffeine addict. (laughs) It's so bad. Like, I bought a 12 case of energy drinks the other day. (laughs) Oh, see, I'm strictly coffee. I try to stay away from it. I go back and forth between energy drinks and then not. (laughs) Yeah, I'll I'll get on, like, a six-month coffee kick, and then I'll think about how it's cheaper to just buy the energy drinks, and so then I just buy those. Yeah, unless you have your own coffee machine, but if you're traveling out of your car, then you probably yeah, don't always have access. And I've already got so much crap in there between all of the wardrobe I have, and then just like normal stuff, and then Brutus and his stuff. It's like, I don't need to add another thing that's just going to get broken or lost. Yeah, totally. I used to travel with instant coffee. Oh, I hate it. I usually do hate it, but there's one brand that I found that I liked, and I took that everywhere. But, I mean, now I just have a coffee maker in my RV, so that's just what I do. (laughs) I'm so jealous. (laughs) (laughs) I thought about getting one, but I don't know, maybe maybe later on when life is more settled. I suppose a French press or, like, one of those cowboy coffee things could work if you had, like... I don't even know how to use those, though. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. I mean, they're pretty... I'm sure they're easy. I just grew up poor, so... (laughs) I'm, like, always, like, what is this fancy thing? Well, the French press, it's just, like, a little glass or metal, like, can, and then you just put hot water in it and strain it. Oh, okay, that's yeah. really sad. It sounds like so much worse than it is. Yeah, it does. When I say French press, it sounds like some kind of espresso machine, but it's actually like the simplest. If they like, had no- affordable espresso machine, I would never drink energy <laughs> drinks again. It would be so bad. Did anybody hear so that? Bad. Somebody get her a portable espresso machine. Stat. I will love you forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping this podcast gets like a really large audience so that maybe people will listen and be like, oh, that's what she wants for our, her birthday next year. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> you just send it to send it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have another question that I generally ask everybody on the podcast. I call it the rising phoenix moment in your life. Can you describe something that you had been faced with, like a challenge or an insecurity that you had to overcome? Besides my life right now? (laughs) (laughs) I suppose. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like there's so many things and nothing at all. Maybe just because, like, I try to move on from things once I work through them. But there's been, I don't know, there's been a lot. I've had a really rough life. Like, I don't know. I feel like if I say rough, like it's going to sound worse. But then I feel like if I don't say rough, it's not going to sound as bad as it was. Mm-hmm. Just a lot of trauma and a lot of like not valuing myself for a long time and letting myself get hurt by just people in my life. But even like within modeling situations before, too, like I let things happen or situations happen and I didn't necessarily leave when I should have because I was insecure about like my worth and so that's something I've been really really working on in the last year or so and just kind of finding myself and finding like not only who I am but my voice and knowing that no matter what happens like I'm sorry (laughs) that it's going to be okay, and I will figure it out. That's amazing and really inspiring to hear it coming out of your mouth, too. You're giving me goosebumps right now. It's been been rather wild. I wouldn't say that anybody who works as much as me does it solely because they love it. It's definitely, like, it's something I love, but it's also an escape a lot of times from other things that I'm not ready to deal with or that I at the time like cannot deal with in a safe way emotionally that's very introspective of you to be able to recognize what's going on as it's happening because not everybody who is working really hard really fast realizes that that they're covering up or like using it as a distraction it's a trauma response it is So listening to you talking about this at the age of 25 makes me wish that I had this amount of introspection when I was 25. So, I mean, thank you for that. I think that the awareness... I I think I got really, really lucky with the family that I have. They're batshit crazy. But (laughs) that being said, both of my parents have divorced parents. So I grew up with four sets of grandparents and they were all wildly different. And I had the whole spectrum of kinds of people in my family, like one set of grandparents who were my lesbian grandmas. Nice. But then on the other side of the spectrum, I have a grandpa and grandma who are Pentecostal pastors. Oh. (laughs) So I grew up very confused, first of all. Also learned to be very open-minded because of it despite being told not to be open-minded by lots of people. But because, like, my my grandmas specifically, they always made a big deal about art and loving yourself, not letting people hurt you. Now, obviously, I didn't listen to this always because I was young and dumb. Mm, But I think I was more aware of what was happening from a younger age because my grandma made it a point to talk to me about those things and to try to make me aware so that when I no longer had her, 
I would be okay. Wow, that's really amazing. She was really amazing. I have Polaroids of her from the 80s of her topless. Nice. And then um, when she passed away, she left me her fur coat. And when she did, she said that I had to take naked photos in it. Nice. Extra nice. She was <laughs> incredible. Did you take the photos? I have. I have. <laughs> um, awesome. During the winter, if I'm like going somewhere that's going to be chilly, it comes with me. I don't offer it to everybody just because I'm very selective. But there are some days I'm like, oh, look, I have the fur coat with me. That's awesome. And I had a, I had a print cell in a gallery last year. And it was the first gallery show I actually got to attend. And it was cold. And I ended up getting to wear the fur coat to the gallery. And that was really special. Aw. Way to go, Grandma. She sounded like a really awesome human. Oh, my gosh. She was crazy. But <laughs> absolutely incredible. Cool. You know, as you've been talking about, like, recognizing that you're working a lot is like a trauma response and I'm kind of relating to it. It's often when I'm doing these interviews with other models, it's often hard to not just like relate to my experience too. So I hope I you don't mind normal. if I <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with relating to somebody else. I think it's actually healthier to relate to somebody else. Like it's it shows community and it's reassuring to know that like you're not the only person who's gone through something like that. You're not the only person who has been through good times, hard times, sad times, whatever it is. Like, we all go through things, but sometimes it feels like you're the only one until you start telling other people about it. Yeah. And what we do is so, it seems so niche. Like, I've tried to, like, think about how many full-time traveling freelance models are there. And I think about the other Facebook groups that I'm in and how many there might be in Europe. And in my mind, I feel like there's between like three to 500 of us. Like, yeah, and I think the, the percentage of ones who are doing it like full time to the point where they don't have any other like streams of income, the percentage of that's even lower. Yeah, like booking, like making full time just off of photographer bookings is it's its own animal <laughs> yeah I, i've probably done around 80 to 100 shoots this year already that's hardcore because i know january i did around 20 february I did around 20 and then i think between march and april i did like 60 ish wow maybe more i'm not sure like i'd have to go back i was insane uh, march and april is just like a fever dream i'm not really sure it really happened and so you, you don't have any, like, uh, Patreon or OnlyFans or online? I have an OnlyFans. I do, Is like, behind-the-scenes photos or, like, some selfies. If a photographer's fine with me posting some of the photos from the sets, I'll throw them up there. Cool. But it's mostly, lately, it's been mostly, like, behind-the-scenes and selfies because that's the only thing I've had time to go through and post. I think I have, like, 15 folders of images right now that I have to that's look through cool. still. Yeah, I, I think it's good to have one, like, even if you're not going to use it in the traditional way that a lot of people use it, just because if you've got fans, that'll support you. They'll generally support you no matter what you're doing. Yeah, so. well, and they want to see, ev like, some people want to see literally everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I originally made it because I got tired of people that I grew up with asking to see my work all the time, and I knew their, like, real reasonings for this. Uh-huh. And I was just like, okay, you know what? I don't mind you seeing my work all the time, but I mind you jacking off to me for free. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the solution. Because for your work that you post, like any like artistic nude stuff, obviously you can't post that on Instagram. And I think that my no. only like interaction with you is on Instagram. So I'm assuming you have like a model mayhem and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I have. I have Model Mayhem, I have Model Society, I have Instagram, I have Twitter, although I always forget Twitter exists. I have a Facebook, I have an implied account, and then I have my website. Cool. I think that's everything. So you can put like some stuff on those platforms, but then all the other behind the scenes and like the selfies and whatnot can also go on OnlyFans for people who just haven't got enough of you. Yeah, crazy people. 
<laughs> That's cool. I'm, I feel like I'm sick of looking at myself, so I don't know how they're not sick of it, but I'm glad <laughs> that they're not. <laughs> cool. Have you had anybody that was from your, like, real life before oh, modeling yes. that you were, like, surprised that they joined your OnlyFans or whatever? I actually blocked a dude. Oh. <laughs> because it was, like, I just felt so uncomfortable, so... It was when I first made the account at the beginning of 2020. And it was a guy that used to work with my mom. Oh. <laughs> and he's literally known me since I was like six. That's creepy. And I was just like, I always got creepy vibes from him. And I, and he had his actual name. Yeah, so I okay. knew who it was. And I was just like, no, refund and block. <laughs> like, I went to school with his daughter. His daughter's the same age as me. Oh, God. <laughs> like that was just a whole new level of creepy everybody else that i've known who was on there like has been super cool about it that's cool like, i have a couple friends from high school or like guys that liked me in high school that i'm friends with but they know like they would never get a chance with me because i've been very open about how i'm not interested yeah and so like i know that some of them have been on there or are on there but they're very respectful about it yeah no that's chill i've had that too and that's like normal. Like you, when you make something like that, you have to expect that people who you know are going to be the ones who are subscribing because they're going to be the ones who are interested. Yes. They're not going to be interested in somebody that they don't know. Yeah, I, I guess it depends on. I, I suppose you could have your internet fans that maybe you don't know in real life. Well, who yeah, but I mean, like you. at the basis. Yeah. Like you're not just going to subscribe to some random girl that you've never met. Yeah. You've never had any interaction with before or anything. Yeah. Like the likelihood of you doing that as to somebody that you know and that you've had a crush on <laughs> and like you've built it up in your head. Yeah. The likelihood of that's a lot higher. True that. <laughs> Especially when they were already harassing me all the time. Yeah. Here it is. Join my OnlyFans and then, you know. And then leave me alone. Yeah. Don't message me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not doing customs. Oh, you know, I haven't had any of my, like, previous party friends or whatever ask for a custom. Oh, but... I'm so lucky. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, I think that I might feel weird about that. Yeah, I it's might... it's real uncomfortable. I was just it's... like, I know way too much about you now. Yeah, I guess it's just, like, it makes it a little bit more personal, where if it's an internet fan that found you just... You know, yeah, I wouldn't fan, care so yeah. much. But, it, it, there, but then again, like... I've done some wild things in my past, too, that I kind of forget about. And I always forget that, like, those people knew me during that time. So I'm like, okay, I really shouldn't be that upset that they're asking. Yeah, I, I guess. Well, like, in high, in college, I had this guy pay me to, like, just demoralize him. It was great. I wish I still had his number. <laughs> <laughs> he would just, like, send me money. And I would just send him, like, mean text messages. That's awesome. <laughs> I wonder what happened to him. So that kind of like takes me into like the whole fetish world. Have you done any like, what do they call it? There's a website called Humiliatrix where it's all like you talking to the camera. I haven't. Oh I haven't. I actually, I haven't done much fetish stuff. I used to do like more bondage shoots and stuff like that, but yeah, I don't do them too much now. I my rotator cuff is torn, <gasps> so that. Yeah. Causes some issues. I'm also a lot more selective about who I will do that stuff with now. For sure. So it's going to yeah. be people I really, really trust or like yeah. know that I can really, really trust. Yeah, I understand. But that. I do have a funny story about a fetish <laughs> shoot that I didn't realize was a shoot. Okay, tell us. <laughs> so this is, oh my gosh, I think it was 2020. I had just moved to Texas and I was in Austin. Or San Antonio, I don't remember. One of the two shooting. And this photographer was like, Hey, do you mind doing this video? Okay, well, what's the video? He's like, All you have to do is sit here in lingerie and blow up balloons and then pop them. Nice. And I was just like, Okay, yeah, sure. And like, I don't, I still don't have a problem with the fact that I did it. It was just funny because I didn't realize that it was a fetish until like six months later. Because I saw a model post, like, she was doing custom videos of balloon popping <laughs> as fetish work. And I was just like, oh, 
my god. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the ones where you're like, wait, are people whacking it to this? Yeah, it has something to do with like the sound of it or whatever. I don't know. But... I, don't, I still don't know either because I've actually done a lot of those fetish shoots. And, and I wouldn't yeah. mind doing it again, but I just think it's hilarious. Like, yeah, six months later, I was just like, oh, oh, I did that. Whoops. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know that it's for a fetish and you didn't realize the guy was going to use that content for a certain activity, then then I'd be like, oh, shit, I got tricked. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But I was just like, uh, it could have been so much worse. I'm not that worried about it. Yeah. But then it did make me think about like my cousin. He's a few years older than me. And when he found out what I do for work, he goes, am I going to see you on like any porn sites? And I was just like, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm like, unless you have a balloon fetish. <laughs> yeah, that's awkward. <laughs> yeah. My family just doesn't Google me. That's cool. They're just like, we don't want to know. Do they know about your nude modeling and stuff? They do. Are they supportive? They're, my mom is super supportive. My dad is supportive as long as he doesn't have to hear about it. Okay. Or see anything about it. Like, he asks how work is. And if I've done anything, like, cool. And I give him very vague answers. And then we move on. My grandma, when she was still alive... She would harass me if I didn't send her photos nice. <laughs> of what I was doing. And then my my other grandparents, I've always been kind of the rebel grandchild. And so they just don't ask me questions they don't want to know the answer to. Okay. Fair enough. That's cool. I mean, at least it doesn't sound like any of them are, like, vehemently against what you're doing. So that's, that's uh, good. I'm sure my grandparents are, but they also know me well enough to know that. It's not going to do them any good to yeah. try to talk to me about it. Like, I'll just cut them off. It's a boundary that they are not going to cross with you. Yeah, cause yeah, they tried to cross my boundaries with politics a oh, few shit. years ago, and I cut them off for, like, eight months over it. <sighs> yeah, that is hard. I deal with that with my family sometimes, and it is really hard. Yeah, they were trying to convince me who I needed to vote for, and I continuously wow. was like, I'm not having this conversation with you. I was like... Yeah. It doesn't matter like who you're saying. I'm not having this conversation with you. Like, yeah. We're not going to agree on yeah. it. And also out of respect for you being my grandparents, I'm not having this conversation. And then kept on and kept on. It was like a whole lunch visit. And I hadn't seen them in months before that. And I didn't know when I was gonna see them again. And that's all they wanted to talk about. And I cut them off after sucks. Because I was like, I can't deal with this. Like, you can't even like be more concerned about what I'm doing than who you think I should vote for. That sucks. It was fine. After about eight months, I was just like, okay. But my they they're a little unhinged. One time, my grandpa changed his name on his Facebook to where it said evangelist and then his name, and that cracked me up because he was commenting on all my stuff and I was like, evangelist, blah blah That's blah. Weird. Or just that is like, so weird. So <laughs> embarrassing. Like, please stop. Yeah. It sounds a little bit weird. <laughs> uh, yeah. Gotta love Southern religion. <sighs> right. You guys are from the South. It's just a different yeah. world down there. See, I'm from Pacific Northwest. So I just. Yeah, but I, like, I know I've listened to like some of your other stuff that you've talked about. Like, I think we have pretty similar like religious issues. Yeah. From childhood. I had a lady I went to church with, she was my youth group leader, who in middle school or early high school, she told all of the girls in the youth group that we needed to not cut our hair because we needed it to be long to wash our husband's feet with on our wedding day. And that after we got married, if we wanted to cut our hair, it was our husband's decision because he was head of household. What? That was pretty much the day I was like, what is going on? What a denomination of Christianity was that? Pentecostal. Pentecostal. That is so weird. Yeah, she that also so told us another time that if we had sex before marriage, especially if it was with somebody who didn't end up being our husband, 
that our husband wouldn't want us because it would be like using somebody else's dirty, crumpled up water bottle instead of a fresh new one. Yeah, I've heard analogies like that before, and I it's just enraging. It's like we're not like pieces of meat or like chewed up gum or like a soda can that just yeah, gets and she wasn't. Up. She wasn't, like, super old either. She's probably in her late 30s now. Weird. And, Um, like, you're telling a bunch of, like, teenage and preteen girls this? Like, that's so detrimental. And I ended up getting kicked out anyways. Oh, good. Good for you. (laughs) Yeah, I wore this, like, little cropped tank top with my skirt to church and... That didn't go over so well. Yeah, they were so loving about was, it. That- yeah, everything <laughs> was covered. Like, you could see, like, one inch of skin and then yeah. my shoulders. But yeah, they asked me to leave. I never came back. Have you seen that documentary, Jesus Camp? No, I probably should. It's a documentary about evangelists who send their kids to, you know, Sunday school. And they all go to this Jesus Camp where, like, they have a a ringleader of it who like trains like all year to think about all these different oh my psychological God. That ways. Like this, that sounds like this revival I went to. That was so scary. I was traumatized for months after that. Yeah. It's a somewhat triggering documentary if you were raised like in church that you had to kind of escape from, but it, it is kind of validating to see that how common it is throughout the country that everybody's trying to brainwash all the kids and stuff. Yeah, it's really terrible. Not only are they, like, trying to brainwash you, but they're, like, at least the church I went to is, like, openly hateful against people that were not like them. Same. And I always had a problem with that, especially with having lesbian grandparents as well, because I'm, like, there's nothing wrong with them. They believe in God, too. Like, they're not going to hell just because they like women. Yeah. That's stupid. (sighs) Yeah. People are judgmental and rude sometimes. That, and I think a lot of people fail to recognize that the versions of the Bible that are in use today have been heavily edited by men Mm -hmm. throughout history. And so, like, who is to say that every single word of what a person is reading today is really what it's supposed to say? Yeah, it's a very And there's been books that are lost or taken out. So it's like... Take it with a grain of salt. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> and just don't hate people. Like, if yeah, you for real. have nothing in common with somebody, just move on with your life. Like, don't try to make their life horrible. Yeah. Agreed. Very much agreed. This topic, sadly, has come up for me a lot recently. I think kindness is key. Kindness is And as key. long as you're a good person and you're kind to others, like, you'll be fine. Yeah. That's supposed to be the basis of religion is being good to others and having good morals and values. I'd say the most quote-unquote Christian people that I know would never ever tell you that they're Christian. Yeah, because they don't want to um, associate with They don't want to be associated. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we are close to the amount of time that my podcast usually lasts for. Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up on the show? I don't think so. I'm sure I'll think of something later and be like, oh, I should have brought that up, but. (laughs) Well, I'm always down to have people come back for another episode, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I want to do this. Like, it's really great to just connect with people. And I feel like it creates more of a community. We get to listen to each other's opinion. You and I get to have a conversation and then other people can hear about it. I want it to keep on going. And so, yeah, I'll reach out to you for another episode. Like, I think it's really good for the newer models too, to be able to listen to and see that like these experiences are not just like things that happen to new models and it's not just them going through things. There's a relatively new travel model who has been reaching out to me recently about help with references and all that. I'm always super, super happy to do that. I want people to be safe. And I recommended that she listen to the podcast. I was like, look, there's so much on here. I was like, that's even like me listening to it made me feel better, but also made me kind of like have a sigh of relief of like, oh, okay. It's not just me. Yeah. And especially like she's already had a couple bad experiences with 
photographers and stuff like that. So I was like, look, go listen to this. There's a lot of really great information in it, but also it'll make you feel so much better about everything that's happened because it's not just you. Well, thank you for passing it along. I, that makes of me course. feel so good. <laughs> I've been telling everybody, I'm like, you need to listen to it. It's great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it's been really great talking to you and getting to know you like kind of over the phone for the first time. Yeah, so we just chatted on Instagram a bit, but I'd love to do this again. Yes, absolutely. I would love that. All right. It's been great having you on the show. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.